necessary item for the shop on Craigslist. I was shopping for a hoist, a uh, chain hoist in the you know, two ton range and happened on this three ton that was local and it was a Yale. So I wanted to go American made on these. Um, this thing turns out was made, I think as a special run of hoists for the military. Uh, it has a three digit serial number. It has a brochure or a manual that was still sealed in the plastic sleeve. And from what I can tell, this thing was never used. It has galvanized chain, and there is just no evidence of anything of being hitched up to this thing. So the previous owner thinks it was a, a shelf spare, but uh, we're gonna get the chain lubed up and get it slung up onto the beam so that we can lift and, and start disassembling some equipment. So the manual says you're supposed to completely immerse the chain or paint the chain with graphite oil. I couldn't find any graphite oil and what they want is they want you know uh, just an oily film and they want the graphite to go into the working areas of the chain. So we're going to make some. Um, I'm going to use a WD-40 as a carrier because nothing evaporates and disappears like WD-40. A little bit of SAE 30 non-detergent uh, to give it you know some oiliness some residue and then I'm going to use powdered graphite which I got from the John Deere store hopefully this is going to be able to spray it but we'll get it slung up and try to coat this chain let's go ahead and uh, let's mix this up and see uh, see if it'll spray I'm just going to put a couple good puffs in here so I previewed my video and I feel I need to clarify a couple of things. One is the oil, the uh, SAE 30 non-detergent is already in the WD-40. How much? About 10%. It's not critical. I didn't want to make up a whole bunch of it because I didn't know how much I was going to use on this chain and there's really nothing else that I can use it for. So there's just a little bit in the bottle. And the other thing was the unit uh, that, that I determined called the puff. And, you know, it's politically correct for people in other countries, pretty much anywhere outside the U.S., we want to put up metric equivalents uh, for the English units that we use. And fortunately for me, the puff is a unitless unit. Well, by that I mean puffs are unitless. And I do have an international subscriber. I've got a guy that lives on Malta, which is really cool. And that's another thing that I always wondered about is how come you live on Malta but you don't live on Australia. It seems like, you know, if you're on an island, it's on, but if it's a big island, it's in. So it's kind of like, you know, he lives in Australia, he lives in England, he lives in Sicily, but he lives on Malta. So somewhere between Malta and Sicily, you know, it changes from in to on. I don't know, I digress. Okay, so where, where was I? We're talking about the puff. So a puff, and that's the term I came up with when I you know, started to put the uh, graphite into the oil. And the only way I can describe it is it's a squirt out of a, out of a John Deere graphite bottle. And you know how big of is a puff? Well, there's a lot of things that you think are standard that are not like drops. So if you're a chemist and you think that all drops are the same, you're mistaken because there's been studies done over 100 years ago about the size of a drop and depends on the, the viscosity of what you're dropping and the drop rate that you drop out of your dropper and the drop sizes can vary considerably. It's kind of like the span, you know, the distance between the uh, pinky and your, and your thumb. Well, my span is very different than my wife's span, I can tell you that. But anyway, so we need to define the puff. So best way I can do it is I'll just graph it. And uh, this is the, you know, KSP scale, the Kunkka Standard Puff Scale, since it's the first time it's been graphed. I'm going to call it the standard. 
Obviously, there's a time element here because you can uh, squeeze this bottle for a different amount of time, and I think it's pretty much implied that you know if we give a short squeeze, we get uh, and our vol this is our volume on uh, on the y-axis. So uh, a short squeeze gives us a little bit of graphite, and a big squeeze gives us a lot of graphite. So you know a puff, I'd say somewhere between a a short puff and a and a long puff gives you gives you this range and obviously you know a quick puff is down here we don't want to do that we don't want to do a heavy puff which is you know way out here so we're looking for this range right in here the sweet spot and let me just call that a good puff and you know of course a good puff one good puff uh, or two good puffs could be equal to a heavy puff and a bunch of quick puffs can equal a good puff but what I do on the video two good puffs I think that works for me I don't know how I can make that any clearer. Oh yeah, I think that'll work. That stuff has one other use I hadn't mentioned. If you wanna make it look like you're working, like if you just wanted to go out in your shop and do something like polish your shaper or something like that, and you don't, you're not really getting dirty, spray some of this graphite oil on your hands before you come back into the house, just kind of walk in like a surgeon does with your hands up, and you'll look like you've just like changed an engine. It's just, it's just ridiculous how black your hands get. That way your wife will you know, know you're being productive with your shop time. Well, I chose not to video putting that up there because that was a lot of struggling and cursing, and but it's hanging. And length looks pretty good. I'm gonna get it up a little higher, but I'm gonna lube down these, these chains with the graphite oil now. Try a test load. That's the only thing I've got that's, I don't know, maybe 1,000 pounds, 1,500 pounds. We'll see how it does.
Well, not a lick of complaining from the building. So I think that's a success. So I'm absolutely in love with my Yale three-ton hoist. I've used it to disassemble the lathe, the Monarch lathe. The last step was to take the headstock off of the bed. Prior to this, I lifted both the headstock and the bed off of the legs. So right now I've got all the pieces of the lathe uh, kind of in a good position to clean. I can pull those legs out of there and start cleaning those out and there's a ton of chips that were trapped in between the headstock and the bed. Real mess in there. But everything was bolted down. You can still see the factory scraping on there. Just got to clean off all the gunk. But everything was real controllable and uh, easy to you know, get real precise movements on everything that you're lifting. And, and this thing really had a proper uh, load test because when we were getting the lathe into position, you know, I only could get it so far pulling it with the tractor. So we hitched it up with the, uh, the hoist, took most of the weight off of the, the skids, and that enabled us to scoot the lathe with a pry bar on the floor. And we got it scooted directly under the hoist. And then I figured out oh, what the heck, you know, three tons. So I went ahead and I lifted the entire lathe, took, took all the weight off of the lathe. And so the only thing that was not attached to the lathe at the time was the uh, tailstock, which is probably 150 pounds. So I, I'd say I was lifting a good 6,000 pounds with the hoist and, you know, not a peep out of it. The building uh, didn't make a sound, no creaks or anything with the building. So I'm pretty happy with that, and uh, certainly it's adequate for handling the smaller pieces that I'll be working with. Well, this is all of the filing you heard. This is a handmade three-quarter five Acme thread, actually a three-quarter five tapered Acme thread, so that we could reuse the broom handle, all handmade.